Our next session is a round table on the topic of Mika, how to prepare for Mika from the perspective of a Swiss Web3 company. Just briefly in the interim, it sounds like there is at least one company which is not a Swiss Web3 company, but which is preparing for Mika. I don't know if any of you saw in the news recently that Binance has announced they will start to delist non-regulated stable coins in the European Union. Sounds like somebody at Binance is getting ready for Mika. But to help you think about how to get ready for Mika, let's welcome our four roundtable guests. First of all, Andreas Glarner from MME. Then Francesco Paolo Patti from Patti Legal. Oh. One second. Andreas will get comfortable. He will sit back, relax, prepare his questions, enjoy a cup of tea, perhaps. Eins, zwei, eins, zwei. We have also Trang Fernandez Denknecht from Holistic Legal. And finally, Thomas Negli from Negli Legal. It is important to mention that Thomas comes to us from Liechtenstein, this small, often forgotten country next to Switzerland, but in the context of Mika, uh, a rather important location. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you a lot for the introduction. Good morning, everybody. Uh, pleasure to be here today and um, discover Mika and the implications uh, on Swiss companies a bit. It's always great to be back here each year. It always feels a bit like uh, being at the university in this room. So it uh, kind of brings up old memories. So what are we covering today? Uh, I think you know, most of you, I would assume, have heard that Mika is coming. Most of you are familiar with the key concept around that is. So we don't want to spend too much time on the boilerplate topics. Uh, I think what we want to focus on really is the implication topics, so kind of a, do a little bit of deep dives, what the time allows us to do, and uh, look at n uh, two key use cases. Um, one use case, a very typical one for Switzerland, would be a company establishing like a foundation or something and issuing a token out of Switzerland uh, with the aim that to be a utility token under Swiss law. So we're going to look at that. What's the impact on Mika on that setup? And another um, use case we're going to look at is more of a financial service use case. A company providing out of Switzerland custody and trading services for digital assets. And we're going to look at what does that mean uh, under Mika for the Swiss company and how could we solve that solution. But before we go into these two use cases, and we have a, a great panels of European legal experts, we have Italy uh, on, on the place, we have Liechtenstein, and we have a tax view with Tron uh, who can cover the whole range. So we want, don't want to only look at it from a legal side, we also want to look at it from a tax side, because as you're going to see, particularly with regard to the second use case, tax is highly important. Um, but before we go into use case discussions, uh, I, I think it would be good to get a bit a holistic overview where we currently stand on Mika implications. We have two deadlines. One has approached and the other one is coming in January. So maybe Francesco, you can shed some light on the latest developments, the future developments, and in particular what the June deadline means on in Mika for stablecoins. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Andreas. Uh, so Mika was published last year in, uh, in May but uh, it will enter into force in two different stages. The first one will be 30 June 2024, and um, it uh, will enter into force with respect to the uh, legislation on stable coins. And uh, in Mika, stable coins have two different definitions, electronic money tokens and asset reference tokens. And uh, so by the end of this month, it will enter into force. Issuance of uh, this stable coins will be regulated under Mika. Whereas the general um, date for the rest of the legislation is uh, by the end of this year, so 30 December 2024. Although one has to say that there is a grandfathering period up to 18 months, 
which will depend on the single European countries. So for instance, it is possible for a country to give a bit more room to the VASPs that already took the authorization, that are already authorized to operate in the national countries uh, up to 18 months after the 30 December 2024, but it depends on the single country. And so it's a bit interesting to see like how the countries are deciding what they're going to do and uh, we're going to have the full picture by the end of this month because the countries that want to opt out this grandfathering period have to do it before 30 June 2024. Another, like it's not really connected to our topic, but uh, about stable coins, it's very interesting to see like what will happen in the next uh, days because we know that we have two major players in the stable coin markets. We have uh, USDT Tether, which I think Swiss people know very well, and, uh, and USDC Circle. And uh, Circle adopted an approach to be fully compliant with uh, Mika, and so they went to France and uh, applied for an electronic money institution license in order to issue electronic money tokens in uh, Europe, where Stetter publicly declared that they are not going to undergo Mika legislation because they find that the legislation has some shortcomings and predominantly the fact that you create a very strong dependency on banks. Like there are some mandatory uh, cash deposits that the issuers of stable coins have to do. They don't like it, they don't see it proper for their business and also risky because of the dependency on the bank. And they mentioned Silicon Valley Bank as an example of uh, risks that a stable coin issuer can encounter. What does it mean for uh, Europe? Like does it mean that all the exchanges will delist uh, tether. The situation is very chaotic. Like in the last days, Binance has declared that they're going to delist USDT in Europe, whereas uh, other exchanges are following a different path. For example, Kraken, also a major player, said, uh, Mika did not enter into force yet. Like we are not obliged as exchange under Mika. It will happen by the end of this year. And so for now, until there isn't a uh, prohibition that is set by an authority, we're going to go on and offer Tether uh, on our exchange. But uh, it yeah, will we'll be see. interesting to see what will happen in the but next But whenever days. we have these kind of gray zone situations on the legal side, the question is also, well, on an enforcement <coughs> level, what is likely going to happen? What, what is our guess that in regulators in Europe will do in, in enforcement proceedings? So who of you dares to give a estimate on that. Actually, I want to add something what Francesco ch just said, and it's kind of interesting to see that Tether has the approach of, yeah, actually we do not want to comply with this very strict regulation, and my personal view on maybe the, the stablecoin regulation is a little bit too tough, uh, but that is for, for, for a reason. Um, and it's interesting to see that our industry was relying on uh, the major stablecoin Tether for years. Uh, for all of the trading pairs, like if, if you want to de-risk, and um, to, to get a lot of transparency now how this is actually secured and backed, right? I think uh, that is a good approach. Um, it's also interesting to see that uh, Binance says we will delist, but there's actually at the moment no really obligation to delist because CASPs are not enforced yet. And then you see Kraken, which says, no, no, we don't have to delist now. We will wait until end of year. So our industry is also changing a little bit, yeah. right? Well, and the again, strategies Binance from had the always the tendency to be overcompliant. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You said that. <laughs> no, but that is exactly the thing, right? And that comes to now coming back to your point about uh, enforcement. First of all, um, that is something which we don't know yet. So we will not. We, we don't know how how uh, the the, uh, the national competent authorities in the European market will enforce uh, Mika. Um, that that's going to be developed. But like normally, and like that is why it's interesting. Maybe even like if strategies of companies change, strategies of regulators do tend like do not tend to change as much right so i think we will have a german buffin which will be rather on the strict end right with enforcement um, they did also already enforce some uh, passportings uh, so for for example when, when we passported some products um, they 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 said that's not suitable for the local market so they are rather strict right uh, but we don't know how the big picture will look like with Mika. Yeah. And there are a lot of questions around enforcement, actually. Uh, reverse solicitation is one thing I think we'll, we might cover later. 
Yeah, wonderful. And maybe also, you know, we talked about different regulators being different on the enforcement side, but also I think we need to be aware that when we talk about MICA and being ready for MICA, that doesn't only apply to the industry, it also applies to the regulators. So they need to set up their teams, they need to uh, gain the know-how, the, the processes, the internal ones, um, to be efficient in granting licenses in the future on the MICA. And I would be interested to hear from you, Francesco, um, which jurisdictions that you see that the regulator is actually putting in the amount of staffing and resources needed to, to get ready by that? Yeah, so I think that uh, one has to consider one big division that exists uh, among European countries. You know that the, the European legislation before MICA was only an AML CFT legislation, and so they, every country had to comply with some parameters, setting up a register uh, for, the, for the VASPs and also controlling that they comply with AML and CFT legislation. What happened in Europe was that in some cases, the authorities that deal with financial um, services and uh, banking law, they, they were competent also for this authorization, for these registrations, whereas in other countries they did not. And so they created a register with different authorities. And in these countries, VASPs are not under the oversight of uh, the authorities that will be competent with MICA. So I make a comparison, for example, like one of the countries that was more proactive apart from Liechtenstein, but I can't say nothing on Liechtenstein, of course, because there's Thomas. And I'm not allowed, Andreas said, do not pitch Liechtenstein, so I'll behave. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, for instance, it, it is France. Like, France was very proactive because uh, you have the authority IMF that was in charge also to grant this uh, AML authorization right now, and so they created a path to MICA that are used to deal with uh, VASPs, and so they presented themselves as the ones that were more ready to deal with these uh, aspects. And they also created like really like VASPs that want to apply with MICA know already what they, what they have to do. It uh, started with uh, the third quarter of last year and so they began these conversations with the authority. Italy is completely the, in, on the other side because the authorities in Italy, Bank of Italy and CONSOP, they said we don't have a full uh, legislation dealing with these players, we don't want to deal with them. It's not our business, we want to wait until there is a comprehensive set of rules. And so in Italy the registration is with another authority which is called OAM, which does not ha really have a prudential oversight on the VASPs. And so in Italy you had to create from scratch like a division that deals with VASPs that was not there from the beginning and that's the case in, in many countries. Now put this difference, what I see is that there will be a big distinction between countries that are more organized at a level of authorities. For instance, Italy was incredibly quick in doing it. I have to say, like, now at the Bank of Italy, you have experts at Consob, you have experts, so if you have the stuff to do it, it's quite easy then to set up everything. But there are countries that are less organized, the smallest countries, like, for instance, we have a member in our association from Romania, and they not even began to organize themselves to approach Mika. And this will give, I think, a lot of arbitrage at the beginning mm. because uh, obviously you cannot get an authorization, but you could operate from a country that is very slow in implementing Mika on a reverse solicitation basis with feeds in, in Europe. Okay, so top three countries in terms of being speedy in implementation, Thomas. You may mention Liechtenstein. I, I, I may mention Liechtenstein, <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm fully biased, obviously. No, but we put, we, like, for me, um, and uh, as, as far as I, I, I see the, the implementation going in, in Europe, I think it's Liechtenstein, uh, France, and that actually uh, took me a little bit as a surprise, Germany. Uh, because uh, Germany for years had the, the strategy to treat everything as a financial instrument, so they even uh, did put, like, Bitcoin under their banking laws. <clears throat> And uh, now they are actually uh, getting ready for uh, 
for Mika. Um, speaking of Liechtenstein, obviously we, we already had a very um, comprehensive legislation in place, our Blockchain Act, which has a lot of service providers which are very similar. Our regulator stayed the same all the time, so it was our Financial Market Authority, uh, which actually was very um, uh, very much uh, in discussion with uh, the, the FINMA in Switzerland as of like they started to, to collaborate in 2016. So we have a very similar approach. Um, and therefore I think we are very well prepared, right? We, we did put a lot of efforts in, we changed our local laws to be to have them ready already, so we changed that uh, it's enforced since February, you can have new service providers. Uh, we even went a step ahead and said, like, not, let's just not get ready only for Mika, but if you listen to the talk before of uh, Dimitrios, he was mentioning what is missing in Mika and what we will see in Mika too. Uh, he mentioned uh, staking and lending, uh, or staking he mentioned, and the second thing he mentioned was NFTs. Both we already have in our legislation, so you can start a, a, a staking and lending service provider and get a registration based on our local uh, law, and you can start that now, right? So yes, I, I think these are the three. France and France was uh, that not, not a lot of people know that, but they were really very active from from, from quite early on, yeah. Good. Now, before we, I think we need to look at the time a bit. Uh, I think before we go into these two use cases, maybe for you, Trung, do you have any particular kind of more general tax considerations uh, on Mika that uh, you want to share with the audience, or is it more on the use case level then? Um, yeah, maybe a, a few general um, comments about um, uh, the taxation uh, across the different countries. Because on the one side, because of the very nature of the uh, blockchain technology on the businesses related businesses, we, we, there are more and more hybrid situations. So on the one side, it's more flexibility, but it means what is expected from the tax authorities is, on the contrary, more certainty. I give an example. For example, if you are, because of the MICA based in two uh, countries, you have to be very precise to indicate, for example, what is the nexus. You cannot say it's still a bit here, a bit here. You have really to be clear what is the substance, what is the nexus, and you have also to be very clear what is the function. Because for years it was easy to say this is a bit here, this is a bit here, but now it's no longer that easy. And also there is a change in the way you define the functions and what are the substantial functions. Because maybe before it was more the banking relationship, it was more certain aspect, uh, more economically based, but now a lot are focused on the AML, but the compliance aspect. So nowadays there is a lot of focus on f essential function on the compliance aspect. It wasn't the case before. So if the taxation principle stays, the requirement in terms of clarity, but also in terms of function will change. And this is about um, the allocation of the taxing rights, because you probably have heard that uh, we are implementing, you know, a minimal uh, taxation rate across uh, the OECD countries. So you have also to define exactly who does what in which country, so that you know exactly where the flows of income goes or where you can deduct whatsoever the taxation obligations are. Okay, thanks. And we're going to deep dive into that a bit further when we look at the second use case. Now, the first use case, a, a very simple one. Um, Swiss company issuing a utility token, so I think an easy scenario would be a Swiss foundation intending to deploy a, a layer one protocol, similar kind of a proof of stake, like a Ethereum style layer one. Uh, token functionality, very clear, gas functionality, you need it to run a validator, you need to stake. So on the Swiss law, non-regulated utility token, which I can freely issue, of course, I'm doing some AML KYC checks as part of the sale to make those proceeds bankable, to comply with sanction laws, but kind of a, a very neat use case. Until today, uh, so far, no big cross-border issues related to the EU. Other countries there may be, but we're going to carve them out for today. Now, assume that this takes place after January 25. Now, Francesco, utility token from a Swiss understanding under MECA, what is that? 
Yeah, that's a good question. I have to say that although uh, Switzerland was a model for Europe, I think in the end the legislation looks differently in uh, Europe. We have a definition of utility token, but the reference in Mika are the so-called assets other crypto assets other than uh, electronic money token and asset reference tokens. So we adopt a kind of residual understanding of this token category, which is a crypto assets that is not a financial instrument and that is not electronic money token and that is not an asset reference token. So that's a bit weird. Within this broader category, we have the utility tokens. If the utility of the token is existent at token launch, then it's fine. Like it is considered as something which belongs more to the area of consumer law than to the area of financial law. And so you don't have to write a white paper, which is the new uh, burden that European law has imposed. Whereas if you launch a token that might be a utility token in the future and that will not be a financial instrument, you have to undergo this uh, duty to publish a white paper to notify it to the authority. When you do it from outside the EU, you have to indicate a hosting authority that will then basically publish this white paper in uh, a joint register at a European level so that there will be a kind of uh, scrutiny of all the tokens. What is the problem of this, uh, of this practice? Like, you can do it in primary sales, like if you do a public offering directly from your website in uh, Switzerland, from uh, Zurich. The other issue is that if you want to list a token on a trading platform in Europe, you need to have a white paper. So it's, it's really a requisite in order to, to be listed on a trading platform. May I just quickly to avoid confusion. Now, we, when we talk about white paper in the context of Mixa, it's not this five-sheet document yeah. we've seen in the ICO days of 16, 17 with a nice picture and some smileys. It's really very close to something what we normally refer to uh, as a prospectus. So there's more content and work on this white paper that you may have seen in the past. Yeah, it's a white paper only in the name. There are also indications about the technology that uh, will be used by the project, but it is very similar to the prospectus. So a lot of information about the issuers and the background and uh, the goal is also similar, like trying to eliminate as far as possible information asymmetry and also building a liability on the issuer or the offerer. And, and that's something which obviously might be very challenging for a project that perhaps is not uh, funded in a way which is incredible because it might be expensive to provide such a white paper. Right, so good news is we don't need a license in to issue a utility token out of Switzerland into Europe. There may be a need for a white paper, depending on the kind of development status of the token, of the functionality yeah. of the token. There is a caveat, but uh, I'm sure that Thomas... Yeah, I was just about to refer to Thomas. Now, um, if I do that and I say, okay, I, you know, I have a fully functional token. Normally, if you have a layer one and you deploy the layer one, the token is functional because otherwise the whole layer would not really work. Um, so you technically don't need a white paper. And could I say, well, I'm not really targeting the EU. So yeah, um, I, I think what you're referring to is the, the challenge we have with, with our reverse solicitation. And Dimitrios also, like in the panel before, touched briefly on it. Um, and I think that is a, a very interesting change of how the European Union actually provides uh, like framework and, and, and supervisory law. Because in the past we were used to this, like to operate under this reverse solicitation. So for the uh, ones who do not know, like I, I want to, to make that very simple. So if you issue out of Switzerland, right, and you don't have like a, a, a very targeted website and you don't target and actively solicit in Germany, um, you can actually op operate under this reverse solicitation exemption. And that was actually accepted, right? Uh, in, in, in most countries. And what is now different is that the European Union said, no, no, with Mika, we will actually limit this operation under the reverse solicitation dramatically, right? Which we don't know yet in every aspect how this will like finally actually look like and how this will be 
enforce? That's the second question. So one is to come up with a rule that you are not allowed to do something. The second question is like who is then actually going to enforce that and, and, and what enforcement is going to look like. Um, so that is a big challenge. So if you then issue a token out of Switzerland uh, and you do target the European market as you did before, uh, that might be a big challenge. The same is actually true for all of the other costs. Right? It's not only about yeah, issuance. So that is a very big challenge. But let me uh, say something uh, with uh, respect of if you'd like step one step back, because I think that is crucial. Imagine now we have for the first time ever a very big economic area like the European digital single market with 450 million people and 23 million businesses, which says we don't stop you from issuing token. We will not disallow that, we will not put you in prison, and we will not do that after five years when you did the issue, and five years later we'll come to your office and say, there's a subpoena, uh, you, you will end up in court. No, the European Union said, we will provide a framework, and you don't even have to publish a white paper in, in so, some instances, but you are allowed to do that if you follow the rules. Yeah, and I think that is really a very, very good statement for our industry. Yeah, thank you for summarizing that. So, from a regulatory side, key takeaways for you on this utility token use case. Um, probably reverse solicitation will not apply, so you need to, because that's very narrow, so you need to comply with MICA, which means either, depending on the token, uh, filing a white paper or not. And if you need to file one, you can choose a regulator of your choice, so you can do some forum shopping. Um, so the last question on the use case, on the tax side, now the proceeds which you receive as a Swiss company out of this utility token sale into the EU, is there any tax impact on the EU level or is it treated like any other income for a Swiss company? So is, is like Mika contain any kind of tax impact for the Swiss company? If the, uh, the introduction of Mika has impact on Swiss companies? Yeah, if, the, um, if I sell as a Swiss company the utility token into the EU, I receive funds. Do I need to tax that in the EU? I assume not, but just to have that confirmed. Well, um, if maybe, again, maybe it depends on the, uh, through uh, which uh, parties uh, you are buying or uh, selling, uh, there may be VAT aspect because they are changing mm -hmm. at EU level. They are uh, a new law. So uh, you always have to consider that. Better be safe than not saying not anyway. Um, and there might be also some uh, transfer pricing aspect because um, if you are to create, because now by, because of Mika, you have to have something in you, right? So, um, and it can be completely a third party, but maybe for some strategy, business strategy aspect, it can be recognized as an associated uh, company. So, so then uh, you have to consider whether you sold it uh, at arm's length or not. Uh, so you have also to define what are the relationship. It can be considered, uh, you, you may think it's not uh, the, the same company, the same group, but there are certain requirements or certain factors that the authorities may consider that you have something in common or association aspect. So these are, would, I would say, the two main things. And uh, when you mentioned about the, the, the time, um, actually, uh, especially in transfer pricing, you don't like to look back and say, well, I, I, I did all this transaction and didn't you know, prepare it. Actually, it's way better to do a few agreements before so that when you start fresh and then somehow you are clean and then you apply the requirements in terms of transfer pricing. These are the two main things I yeah, see. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Now, may, may I add something no, for the sorry. perspective? Because <laughs> that is actually something which we identified. We have the same VAT, right? So yeah. Liechtenstein and, and, and Switzerland. So you just like get rid of one added complexity uh, yeah, in that respect. That's true. And uh, I think because I, wanted, I do want to cover in the last four minutes the second use case, at least briefly. And now the second use case, again, just it's a Swiss-based exchange payment utility token only, no securities. Uh, aiming to operate into Mika, so it, it, Mika will apply, and obviously we're going to need a Mika-based license. Uh, and so I need to set up a company within Europe. I can't get the license out of Switzerland. Um, now we before said a couple of jurisdictions which are going to be interesting to look at. Liechtenstein being one of them. And 
maybe Thomas, you can explain this. What would the process look like? What kind of license do you need? How long would it likely take? And where do you see the benefit of having this structure, having a company in Switzerland and uh, a Liechtenstein entity serving the European market? So first of all, Liechtenstein is not a member of the European Union, uh, and I don't want only to talk about uh, the good things of Liechtenstein. One, one challenge we have is that we are only a part of the European economic area. So uh, in Liechtenstein, as of now, we think that Mika is going to be applicable uh, um, 1st of February. Uh, we are working on that with Iceland and Norway, so there is, that's just a, a, a small disclaimer. Let's assume that uh, it is already enforced in Liechtenstein, um, then you can get uh, your, your license uh, with your national competent authority, and that's our financial market authority, um, and I want to, to keep that really brief. Um, so depending on which type of license you're actually looking for, you could also start today and get the local registration under the old regime and then apply for an easy change of the local registration into a, to a MICA license. Um, if you start after MICA is enforced, uh, is, is enforced uh, you'd have to fulfill all of the requirements uh, based on MICA. And it's not uh, that you don't have to comply uh, uh, if, if, you, if you start now. If you start now, you fall under the grandfathering and then you have to actually top up what is actually under of, of, of the level of, of MICA. Um, and how long that takes, we don't know, right? So we are working on that. We have like uh, companies in that proceeding. We do even see uh, quite some interest from Switzerland. We have, so we have Swiss companies uh, doing exactly that path now, but we don't know cost and time-wise. That's something we can tell you in a year or two. Yeah. And, and one of the great things about Liechtenstein and Switzerland in the combination is Don't chill Liechtenstein, please, Andreas, behave. <laughs> <laughs> All right, about this small uh, part of Switzerland. Uh, <laughs> now, uh, that Liechtenstein acknowledges that substance based in Switzerland can also be substance that is Liechtenstein substance because you know there's not that much room in this neighboring country. Um, and so the question always is, you know, if you have a hybrid structure where you have the core team in Switzerland and you have a subsidiary in Liechtenstein, which kind of feeds on the substance or key substance in Switzerland, um, where is the effective place of management from a tax perspective? So Trung, I think what are the key elements that the Swiss company needs to assure that suddenly uh, the Swiss tax authorities don't see the Liechtenstein company to have the effective place of management in Switzerland and be taxable in Switzerland? Yes, so um, usually I would say the, the traditional way to see substance is always uh, where is the effective uh, management uh, taking place. Usually we talk about the offices or the number of employees, etc. Um, this stays, of course, um, but because of this um, you know, double uh, hybrid nature, um, you have really to show uh, also uh, way more what the presence that is very important because because of the COVID, a lot of people have just offices. You say you can save a lot, and then uh, as long as you put uh, av uh, available offices, it should be enough. But that won't be enough. You have really to show presence, and you have also um, an adequate number of expenses that uh, uh, will be uh, expected from you, and also the qualification. Because the one way uh, it's very common for foundation or other companies is, of course, to have um, uh, an address, uh, to have a director, but it won't be sufficient because the topic is so technical, uh, there will be also expectation in terms of qualification of the people, and also, for example, this is more tax aspect or accounting aspect is because you, usually the tax authority, they consider three types of substance. Um, they consider the functional uh, of substance, which is uh, where you do what. The operational, which is indeed where the, the management or, or the decision, the key decision are made, and also the accounting or financial aspect is how is your company structure in terms of uh, financial resources and accounting uh, aspects. Okay, thank you. Now, I see our time has lapsed, so uh, maybe a quick summary on the second use case. Key takeaway, so in this use case, make sure you get an appropriate license within a European economic area or European Union jurisdiction to target the European market. If you build it 
partially with this substance in Switzerland, in the example of Liechtenstein, where you can do that, you need to make sure that the team is split up in a way that you don't have negative tax consequences. So tax planning and structuring will be highly important, and also, of course, the VIT topics. Now, uh, I think maybe one last round. Any final comments on the topics we had from your end, Francesco? Anything you want to add? Um, no, I think that custody is also important because it's the first time that we have a reserved activity for custody, whereas in MIFID it was uh, not really the case. And so now we have some legal parameters. They are not so precise. So what really custody means in terms of uh, technology is something which is debated because a lot of players are a bit afraid of being captured by this uh, definition, which is kind of generic. And, and so this will also be one of the challenges of the next uh, months too. I think I just want to say that last year we started the discussion about what Mika means for Switzerland and I think it's uh, one of the biggest opportunities uh, because Switzerland has a lot of strengths and they will keep them. It's uh, globally the, the, the best brand I have actually, you, you hear about Switzerland everywhere. So I think the combination of having access to Europe uh, and, and having a Swiss company, that's really the, the best thing you can do. So be proud uh, of, of what, what Switzerland has to offer. And I'm, I really mean that, right? It's not that Mika is a threat. We don't know a lot of things about Mika, how it's going to be enforced, how it's going to be look like. Uh, you have a very uh, vivid ecosystem in Switzerland, and that is something to be proud of. Thank you. Zhuang, any? Um, yes, uh, to conclude, so basically um, you still, of course, uh, can structure and have different parts, but let's say for, for Europe or Liechtenstein, you have to think about indeed the people, where are the key people, where are they based and where are the decisions made, uh, where are the infrastructure operation taking place and also what are the source of income or I would say the, the assets. So those are the, the main thing I would say that maybe secure uh, the, the present in uh, certain countries. And the next question indeed, once you have in that country, where how do you manage to then um, allocate the different resources between the different countries, be it in personal or in income and other uh, functions. Wonderful. Thank you. That was a wonderful discussion. I could continue it forever. Um, no, not forever. Um, we don't really have time for questions, I'm afraid, I believe. But we're going to be over here hanging around and <laughs> take questions there on a direct level. Uh, thank you a lot for attending and enjoy the rest of the morning. Thank you so much. Thank you.